Can we give God some glory one more time? Hallelujah. Happy Resurrection Day. We want to welcome all the visitors who came out today. God bless you. Thank you and welcome here. I pray that you would buckle in your seat right now because we're about to get into the word of the living God. And it may not just be your average word that you heard on, uh, on an Easter day. You might hear some things, but it's gonna, we're going to go deep today and really break down why it is important to understand the resurrection of the life and why Jesus gave that declaration. Amen? And so before we jump in, I'm going to pray that God will just soften your hearts and your minds today, okay? <laughs> All right. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for the resurrection. We thank you, God, that you give us hope, eternal life. You give us vision, Lord God, that we may not perish, Lord. God, you came to this earth with a divine purpose, a plan, Lord God, a blueprint for mankind. And that blueprint and that plan started, Lord God, when you entered into this earth with a mission to die, to be buried, and to resurrect the third day, to give us all hope in a future, Lord God, and all of that lies upon your resurrection. So we thank you, God. We ask, God, that our minds and our hearts will be open unto you, Lord God, and to your word. And, God, that you will give me the words to say, God, that I may preach your word with clarity, Lord God, transparency and authority, Lord God. Father, we give you all the praise, all the glory for sending your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ one more time? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so the word of God says here in John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? If there was another title that I would have titled this message, it would have been titled, Do You Believe This? Do you believe this? Jesus declared and identified himself through some amazing imagery, uh, phrases that related to his character, related to his nature, and it related to his person throughout the Gospel of John. And it starts off with declarations that start off with, I am. Right? Somebody say, I am. Right? So he starts off from, I am the Son of Man. You find that in, in John chapter 6, verse 27. And then he says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6, verse 35. He says, I am the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the gate for the sheep, John chapter 10, verse 7. I am the good shepherd, right? Everybody loves that one, hallelujah, right? I am the good shepherd, that's found in chapter 10, verse 11. And then we hear, I am the way, the truth, and the life, as found in 14, uh, verse 6 in, in, uh, in, in John. And then, I am the true vine, chapter 15, verse 1. You see, but there's one of the most interesting of his declarations and identifications is when he declared, I am the resurrection, and followed this declaration with, and the life. You see, this one was unique in all by itself. And it was unique for a reason, because if he is not the I am the resurrection, then all the other ones have absolutely no meaning. No meaning at all. But he's the good shepherd. Yes, he is. But if he is not the resurrection, he is but just a good shepherd that has no hope for us. Just somebody that would guide us and lead us. We have a whole bunch of people that can guide us and lead us. But if they cannot do anything about death, what difference does it make? Right? Right? Yes, he is the way, the truth, and the life. But if he is not the great, I am the resurrection, even that has absolutely no meaning to the believer or the individual that needs to take care of death and sin. Amen? And so two, uh, two essences we do not normally put together in one frame of thought is death and life. You see, one thing for certain, for every human being inside this room today, we will die. Should the Lord tarry, we will die. Now, if God comes back, then the Bible says some of us will not die. We will simply be transformed. And that transformation will give us a glorified body. And the Bible says that we will meet the Lord in the air along with everybody else who has died as Christians that will receive that glorified body and meet all of us in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ to never die again. How many people know that's some good news? Amen. And so Jesus Christ when he talks about a resurrection, you have to understand that it comes in the concept and in the idea and belief that goes directly against death. You see, and these are two opposing factors in our own understanding of finite ability to understand things, let alone the things of God. 
Jesus Christ is the only one who is able to declare something that is so contrary to each other like death and life. Death and life. You see, when Jesus Christ is in the picture, death and life for him have about the same meaning. For us, without Jesus Christ, death is hopelessness. Death is the end. Now, we may put some cute things after that, right? Man, I hope you, you rest in peace. I hope for some of us right from the neighborhood, right, man, he's going to ball in heaven, right, with Tupac and Biggie and everybody else where all this stuff started happening, right? Oh, man, he's going to, you know, he's going to rest in heaven and, and all these other things. That, man, you know, God took another good one, right? You all know what I'm talking about, right? Man, we lost another soldier, man. Yeah, God's got a good one up there. Ladies and gentlemen, I come today to tell you the good news and even some bad news for some of us, right, that there is no heaven for an individual like that. There is no heaven for a G. There's no heaven, right, outside of Jesus Christ. When death comes, there is hopelessness because after death, the Bible says, comes judgment. And after that, that means that we live, we die. And well, apart from Christ, we stand before God, the judge. And from there, we are sent to Hades or hell awaiting a second death, which is the lake of fire. And so I have to say these things because we have to understand how contrary death and life is apart from Jesus Christ. They have no, no togetherness apart from him. But see, when Jesus Christ steps on the scene, he's able to make such a, an oxymoron of a declaration about himself and say, I am the resurrection and the life. Like, wait a minute, wait. You are de you know, death and life? You bring uh, uh, life to death? Like, how? And see, we cannot understand this concept because it goes beyond the uh, finite into the infiniteness of God himself. Death brings life. Death brings life. Only in Jesus Christ. And so for many of us, we have this death is but the end of life and resurrection in life is never instituted within the perspective of this side of the grave, but rather in a peaceful state of heaven or one of rest. That's how we comfort each other, right? Yet Jesus places two opposed of opposites and joins them together and then gives a living example to the resurrection of Lazarus from the grave of what he was speaking of when he spoke of this nature and attribute as the resurrection and the life. We're going to be going through the, the chapter 11 of John in regards to Lazarus and the resurrection that Jesus Christ did with him. And so I'm not going to have these verses on the screen. You're going to have to open up your Bibles, right? Come on, somebody, right? Pray. Hopefully y'all brought your Bibles. I know you brought your phone. Download a Bible app real fast and open up to John chapter 11. And then you can follow me through that. We're going to be going over verses 1 all the way to 44. Hence the reason why it's not going to be on the screen. But if you guys can follow along, We'll be able to receive what God is having us to receive today. Amen? And so, we go from there. It's Easter Sunday. I want to take a few moments using the resurrection of Lazarus to explain Jesus' declaration as the resurrection and the life and what that means for us. Jesus, in John chapter 11, verse 1 through 44, has four conversations that surrounded his declaration of being the resurrection and the life. And these four conversations are geared towards the belief of who Jesus is and what he alone is able to do and was meant to do for all who believe. And so I will pose the question again, do you believe? This event occurred about one month prior to Jesus' own resurrection that gives life to all who would believe in Jesus as both Savior and Lord or the Son of the living God. Jesus receives word going to uh, John chapter 11, uh, verse 1 on down. He receives word from the sisters of Lazarus, who was Mary and Martha, who sent word to Jesus to inform him that Lazarus, the one Jesus loved, was sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. You guys hear the declaration beforehand? Very similar language to Genesis, except the enemy was using it for his own purpose. You see, God said in the beginning, right, in Genesis, right, hey, you could eat everything, right, all the canapas over there, all the fruits over here, you can do apples, I got oranges over here, I done planted some grapes over here, but this one fruit right here, you cannot eat or you will surely die. You cannot eat or you will surely die. And then the enemy comes, right, and what does he say? To, the, to, to Adam and Eve, you won't surely die. 
you won't surely die. And they were like, wait, wait, wait a minute, what? But God said we will die. No, no, you won't surely die, right? God just doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. And so what happened? They disobeyed God. They ate the fruit. And what happened to them? Did they die? Technically, no. The physical body kept on going. But see, something that we fail to realize, right, on resurrection day is that they did die. They died spiritually. And in that spiritual death, what ended up happening was there was a separation between man and God's relationship. And the thing that took the place between man and God's relationship is a thing called sin. And when sin entered the world because of disobedience to God's commandment, which it was a commandment not to eat the canepas, we'll call it canepas today, not to eat the canepas or the, or the mangoes, whatever your favorite fruit is, right? Not to eat that fruit right there. Death came into the world through sin. And what happened? It separated them. That now man had to experience a spiritual death because they disobeyed God. While they were living, they still were dead. And see, the problem that we have even today is that we have all of us here and people out there in the world and society and communities all over this world that while they are alive in the physical we're able to breathe. We're able to have relationships with one another. We're able to sin. We're able to do all these other things, right? Have feasts. For some of us, we're going to have good, some, some good old food after Sunday church of resurrection, right? We're going to do all these other things while at the same time, they're dead. They are dead spiritually. Within them, there's a separation between God and them because they have yet to be resurrected. You see, today I want to talk about two kinds of resurrections through these conversations that many of us fail to be taught, the preachers fail to preach. We all focus on he is alive, and yes, he is alive, but the question is, will you be alive when you die on that day? Because if you have not yet come alive on this day, on the today day, and you wait for that, he is alive, I got my golden ticket, and I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be alive again, and you wait for that one, I'm sorry to tell you, you will never see the kind of life that God has given you after death, you would only see another death, and that's called the second death, right? And we'll talk about that in a moment. And so we have to understand what Jesus is talking about and what he's trying to exhibit in this chapter. And the example is with Lazarus, amen? And so he makes this declaration. It is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Yet Jesus stood where he was at for two more days after they told him that Lazarus was sick. Then said his disciples to, uh, for them to go back to Judea. During this time, Lazarus had died. Jesus informed them that Lazarus had fallen asleep and that he was going where he was to wake him up. The disciples did not understand that Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus has died. This is the first conversation Jesus has, which was with his disciples, a conversation I am going to call so that you may believe, so that you may believe. I'm going to bust out this Bible for some of us that don't have a Bible. I'll read a little something, right? This is what the Lord says uh, here in the Word. He says, uh, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, verse 11, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. You know, pretty logical understanding, right? Oh, that's going to be okay. If he's, if he's sick, he got the flu, let the man sleep. He's going to be all right. Don't, we don't want to bother him, right? But they were missing what God was trying to teach them in regard to spiritual death. His disciples uh, replied, Lord, let him sleep, right? So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And look at what he says, so sassy, right? I love sassy Jesus. He says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, somebody say, for your sake, I am glad I was not there. See, at first glance, you'd be like, man, Jesus, that was, that was bogus. Like, that's just, just dirty. You know what I mean? I wish you were here with me. You know what I mean? Like, but, yeah, I wish. He's like, I'm glad I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. But let us go to him. And so something's going on. Is Jesus really that shady? Is it really that bogus? He could be. Because there is plenty of scripture that shows the sassy Jesus that I love and I come to love personally as my Lord and Savior. Amen. But on this one, he makes, it, uh, he makes a declaration here. He says, so that you may believe. Why is this all happening? So that you may believe. Why did it allow Lazarus to die? So that you may believe. 
Now, off the top, we may think, like, man, that doesn't make any sense. Like, we already believe, God. Right? If I put a, 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 a census here and say, well, how many people believe in Jesus Christ and his resurrection? Everybody's hand will probably get up, including the kids, be like, I believe, yes, Jesus is my Savior, and start singing songs and stuff, be all happy. Everybody will be good with that. Everybody believes. But the reality is, some people, if you die today, you will go straight to hell. Even though you believe. They believed. Why would Jesus have to say, so that you may believe? I believe the reason why he's saying this is because he's trying to teach the disciples and let them grow in the relationship with him to understand a thing called spiritual death. Spiritual death is something that a lot of us kind of, kind of avoid because spiritual death, in order to come back alive, means spiritual life in Christ Jesus. We no longer live to ourselves. We now live unto the Lord. And see, right there, many of us have a problem. Can we keep it real in church today? Well, we should keep it real out of church too, but just for the sake of understanding, can we keep it real in church today, right? You see, when it comes down to living for Jesus, you know, I believe in Jesus, but man, I don't got to really live for him, right? Like, I ain't got to stop doing some things, right? Like, I don't like, like, I believe, though. The Bible says if you believe that, you know, everything will be okay. You see, we have to understand, and I think a lack of preaching, real good preaching, right? Doctrinal preaching, exegesis uh, preaching, right? Meaning exiting the scriptures of what Jesus Christ is actually saying is lacking in the 21st century. That now we have this, this very mundane, very dry, very dead belief in Jesus Christ. That when you look in the world and you see believers, you see that, and then non-believers, you see there's not really much of a change. They both look the same you got to ask yourself why. Well, the answer to this one that I would say is, do you really believe? Do you really believe? Jesus Christ allowed this to happen so that they may believe. Amen? He sounded sassy in this conversation with the disciples as he exclaims, and for your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. And I don't believe this was sassiness though, right? Even though... Jesus gets sassy. Amen? But I believe that it came from a position of, uh, not from a position of anger, but rather from a position of crying, a position of pain and heartbreak. You see, he loved Lazarus. But even more than that, he for so loved the world. And now here it is, Lazarus has died, one of his close companions. And he makes this declaration to them, I believe, really holding back tears. And for your sake, I, I'm glad I wasn't there because he knew his mission. And his mission was to get them to believe that he is who he says he is and that he came to do what he said he came to do. But see, they're all over the place, these disciples, just like many of us. We're all over the place. We claim belief, but we're still living our ways. We're still doing whatever we want to do. We're all over the place. And this one, Jesus had to allow to happen. And so here it is. I really believe from a heartbreak. That Jesus had already declared that this sickness of Lazarus will not end in death, but rather it was meant to glorify God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. There was some form of glory that was supposed to happen because of this situation, and it would be the glorification of the Son of God. Now, mind you, this is a month before his own resurrection. But here he is about to perform one of the greatest miracles next to his own, right, like right below his, to resurrect Lazarus. Now, Jesus resurrected the dead prior to Lazarus. It was about two occasions. He resurrected a daughter and then somebody else, right? And so, and so from, the, from the grave. But this one was different. This one, as we'll learn in a moment, was dead, buried in a grave for four days. Big difference. Big, excuse me. Big, big difference, right? And so he allowed this to happen because God wanted the Son to be glorified so that we can believe. So the question would be, believe in what? Amen? And so Lazarus' sickness led to his death, and here is Jesus exclaiming that he was glad that he was not there so that the disciples may believe. This sickness that actually led to Lazarus' death would not be a contradiction of the declaration of Jesus, but rather a display and declaration that was not one of final death and an opportunity for Jesus, the Son of God, to be glorified through it. Remember, Jesus had already said in chapter 11, verse 4, that it's not going to lead to his death. But then what happens two days later? Lazarus dies. So it's like, Jesus, are you... Are you telling the truth? Are you contradicting yourself? 
You see, he said Jesus, that Lazarus was going to be sick, but he will not die. Two days later, Lazarus dies. Lord, are you telling the truth or are you alive? What, what's going on here? Wh which one is it? Because he is now obviously and apparently dead. See, but for Jesus, see, he looks at death a little bit different. See, for us, death is like, that's it, you're dead. For him, death is but sleep. Because in a moment's time, and by the word of the Lord, Brian, come forward. And Brian will rise as though he was never dead. And so for Jesus, he wanted to teach us something. And so therefore, Lazarus had to die. What is God trying to tell us here? In order to have a resurrection, my friends, there needs to first be a death. There needs to be a person who is dead in order for Jesus to do a resurrection. And so what he's trying to tell us here, the example he ended up using with Lazarus. Lazarus was sick. That led to his death. And Lazarus then was died. He died. He was dead. And so what happened now? Jesus now comes on a scene and he begins to teach his disciples, right? And through teaching his disciples, he's telling to everybody else and his disciples, including us who would read this 2,000 plus years ago, and telling us that he's glad that Lazarus had died, that he wasn't there, because it was for his own glorification of God, so that we can believe. And he's trying to let us know and tell the world, apart from Jesus, you are already dead. You are spiritually dead. And in order to have a spiritual resurrection, a true resurrection, there has to be a life that is dead. But the problem is, is that we live in a time, even then, as that time, is that we refuse to acknowledge to the Lord that apart from you, I am dead, God. We refuse to acknowledge how we really are in the state that we're really in. You see, many of us will belittle sin. Many of us will kind of dilute the fact that we are dead. Some of us will say, well, I'm dead, but thank God, I'm still breathing. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. But are, you, but are you alive spiritually? You see, we have a whole bunch of walking dead people. And what God is trying to say is that he is here to resurrect us. But the only way we can experience true resurrection is that we have to acknowledge and know that I am dead in need of resurrection. You see, for some of us, we just want resuscitation. Let me say that again. For some of us, we just want resuscitation. We want God to kind of zap us, and we get up for a little bit, and then we start doing whatever we want to do again until we need another zap. You see, God is not in the business of zapping. He's in the business of resurrecting and resurrecting to an absolute new life. He is the resurrection, and he is the life. Amen? Jesus asserts such death by staying where he was ministering for two more days rather than running to the aid of Lazarus and healing him on the spot. We must understand that when Jesus moved and operated, when he was walking the face of the earth, it was always done with purpose and intentionality that gave a dual meaning of one's physical as well as spiritual lives. The reality was that God wanted to use Lazarus' death to prove his power over death shown to his disciples and others and prove the resurrection from the dead was and is the most crucial belief of the Christian faith. For Jesus to declare all the other declarations from the Son of Man, which meant his divinity, the bread of life, meaning living, uh, life-giving row, the light of the world, which symbolizes spiritual truth, and the gate of the sheep, the only way into God's kingdom, yet not be able to address that which affects us all, being death itself, not just the physical death, but the spiritual death, would leave us but on a hopeless endeavor, both on this side of the grave as well as on the other side of the grave. It is for this reason the belief of the disciples and even us must go beyond the mere physical need of Jesus, but even more the spiritual need for Jesus. For without the resurrection, both physical and spiritual, we are hopeless creatures. Hopeless. You see, we know that Jesus, he confessed and declared all these different I am's. And we go to him about all these I am's. God, you're the bread of life. God, I need some food. God, you're the gate. You know, the gatekeeper. God, I, let me in. Right? I'm going to do some good works. Let me in. Right? God, you're the good shepherd. God, I need you to take care of me. But we never truly go to God and say, God, I'm dead, and I'm in need of life. I'm in need of resurrection. Amen? And so we have to understand the importance of acknowledging the need of both and spiritual and physical. 
The Bible says in Romans 6.23, Amplified, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God, that is his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We see what sin does. It leads to death. And so, therefore, God must deal with our sin. We are all born into sin due to the original sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden when he disobeyed God and was separated or spiritually dead from God due to sin, which led to spiritual and physical death. You and I were both sinners and into sin, are born, in, are born sinners and into sin, and born spiritually dead and separated from God. We must understand this. When we were born, no matter how cute we were, no matter how ugly you were, right? Some people say, all babies are ugly. I don't think so, man. I'm just going to be honest. I've seen a lot of babies in my little time. Some of them are ugly, man. God bless them. God bless them, Right? Some people believe that they're all cute. I'll be totally 1,000, man, as a, as a pastor. I'll be really honest. As just a person, some of them are ugly, man. And you're like, God bless you. Your mother loves you. Your daddy loves you. But regardless of cute or ugly, they're all born into sin and in need of resurrection power by Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, listen, apart from Jesus we are all walking dead, yet while breathing and living lives, heading to a physical death that would lead to an ultimate death called the second death. Can I show you guys what I'm talking about here? Listen carefully to the characteristics of this person that will be going to hell. Revelation 21.8 says this, But as for the cowards and unbelieving and abominable who are devoid of character and personal integrity and practice or tolerate immorality. I got to read that sentence again. Somebody say amen. Some of y'all like, please don't read that again. I'm convicted. But it says this though, right? We are devoid of character and personal integrity and practice or tolerate immorality. Immorality is sin. And murderers and sorcerers. This is going to blow some of y'all mind right here. What are sorcerers? With intoxicating drugs. I'm trying to see if it says weed there. I don't Right, some of us are like the pastor don't say weed there. They legalize that thing. They might have taken that out of the Bible. No, it's an intoxicating drug, right? That comes under sorcerers, right? With intoxicating drugs. And idolaters or occultists. What is an occultist? One who practice and teach false religions. And all liars who knowingly deceive and twist truth. Their part will be in the lake that blazes with fire and brimstone, which is the what kind of death? Second death. You go from the first death straight waiting to the second death. A believer may still die in the physical, but they don't go to another death. The physical goes into eternal life, living with Jesus forever. And it comes from that resurrection power of Jesus. And so this is the difference between one who doesn't believe, or for that matter, does believe, but refuses to do anything with their belief in Jesus Christ. They refuse to be resurrected in the spiritual. Amen? And so... Jesus orchestrated this event to exemplify the ultimate event of his death for mankind's sin that led to both spiritual and physical death in which he himself would resurrect himself from the grave so that they and we may believe. We may ask, what is it then to believe in Jesus? I think that's a legitimate question because many people are walking around saying they believe in Jesus but then you're hearing this word, and it's like, wait a minute, but people are going to go to hell. Well, what is it? How do you believe in Jesus? What is it to believe in Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to hear the answer through the conversation, the second conversation, which is a conversation with Martha. Amen? And I call this one, do you believe? Right? Not in magic, not in Disney, not in Toy Story. Not in none of these little favorite cartoons that I have. I don't know about you guys, but I love these cartoons, right? But do you believe in Jesus as the resurrection and the life? Jesus and the disciples, upon their arrival, finds out that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Lazarus is not just a little dead. We must understand this. He is a lot of dead, all right? He's dead, in fact, for four days dead. That's a lot of days, all right? Four days in the, in, in the grave, four days. It was not that Jesus did not know how many days Lazarus had been dead, right? Even though, you know, they, they come tell him. He knew it because he knew all things, right? It's not that he didn't know he was dead in the tomb, but that we may know Lazarus' death and resurrection was not one that some may call a resuscitative death. 
that one is revived back to life from apart, uh, uh, from apart from death. But rather, Lazarus was dead, dead. There was no bringing Lazarus back with some machine. There was no electrocuting him and zapping him to bring him back to life. This man was dead, dead. He was in a grave, buried dead. Linens wrapped around his body, a cloth over his face, as, uh, his face, as we'll talk about in a moment here. Jesus wanted everybody to know that this man was dead. There's no tricks up his sleeve. There's no doctors on scene. When I get there, just keep him alive, let him die for a little bit, and then zap him again so that when I get there, it'll look like I'm bringing him back to life in, in a thing. No, it was none of that. It was no tricks. He wanted everybody to know that this man is dead, and he's been dead for four days, and there's a reason behind it. Amen? And so he goes on ahead and it continues, right? He's in the tomb, Lazarus, right? And now we know he is dead, dead. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many people done that to God? God, if you only had been here, you could have saved my mama from cancer. If only you had healed her. God, if only you would have answered my prayer, my little babies will be alive right now. God, if only you would have done this, God. And we start to blame God, amen? We start to put it all on Jesus. God, it's your fault, God. I'm tired of it. That's why I'm, I'm not believing. That's why I don't believe in organized religion. And we use all these excuses. That's why I'm not faithful to the church. That's why I'm not faithful to you, God. I just call on you when I need you, God. And do all this. But other than that, God, I'm tired of this stuff. I'm tired of it, God. I'm not doing it no more. If only you would have been here, God, my brother would have been alive. And see, all of us felt that at one point or another. If only, God, if only and we subjugate God to time and space without realizing who we're dealing with. God doesn't draw off time and space. He is God outside of time and space. And while you may look like your life is dead, God still has a plan to bring you back to life if you but allow him to. You see, some of us, we blame God for even the situations that we are in right now, just like Martha. Martha's heart was shattered, broken from her brother's death, just like many of us would be if our brother had died. And then knowing that we know Jesus and he's on the scene walking around just free, just what's up? It would break our hearts. And some of us even right now are going through situations that are breaking your heart. And you say, God, why couldn't you stop this? Why couldn't you do something? You want to know the answer to this question right here? You guys want to know it? You may not like it, but you want to know it? God says, because I'm trying to lead you to resurrection power. But God, the situation hurts, God. He says, I know how much you think it hurts me to see my children go through pain. How much you think it hurts me that I had to send my only son to die for you on that cross and watch him get butchered. But see, I had to allow and set up the situation for my son to die on the cross and then be resurrected on the third day. Why? Because it was only through him that you can be resurrected and receive life. And right now, God is putting us through situations. Hear me again. God is putting us through situations. I thought it was the devil. The devil be doing some, some old dumb stuff too. But we give him too much credit. And we fail to realize that God operates in his own way. And see, God would take us through situations that we think, this got to be the devil. But you ever ask yourself or even ask God, God, is this you? Why am I back here in this wilderness? Why is this happening again to my marriage? Why is this happening again to whatever it is, my life? You ever fail to ask, God, is this you? Are you doing this, God? Are you leading me back into the wilderness? And then after that, I ask, well, then why, God? See, James in chapter 1 says this. When you find yourself in divers temptations and trials and tribulations, ask for wisdom. And the God who gives without partiality, meaning he doesn't give and be like, well, let me make sure your life is good. Have you been praying? Have you been memorizing scriptures? Oh, you ain't even going to church. I can't give you no wisdom, man. I'm just going to talk to me when you go back to church. He don't operate like that. He says, ask him for wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge. So he'll give you the knowledge to apply to your life so you can understand why you're going through that thing and then go through it intentionally. But we need to ask God for wisdom. God, why am I going through this? And see, God loves to answer questions. Sometimes he doesn't answer them the way we want to. And sometimes we just ask him, like, God, just get me out of it. And God is like, I can't because I put you in it. Well, God, well, get me out now. I can't because you need to, I need to let this thing like fire burn up all the pride inside your heart so you can know. Stop walking away from me. You see, without this situation, we have ne would have never known the power of God over death. And see, your situation may look like it's dead, but God is the resurrection and the life. And he's able to give you resurrection life even today. 
But the reality is we have to come and admit, God, I need to be resurrected. You see, in our religious state, in our state that we think we're all good, I don't sin that bad. Right? I'm not, like, I still be doing good. I pay my tithes. I sometimes come to church. Right? I do good things at work. You know, I do little different things or whatever. I do my boss's, my boss's job, you know, sometimes and stuff. I mean, we're having an affair, but, you know, at least I'm doing, you know, I'm doing good. I know it sounds wild, but this is some real stuff. Because the reality is we like to point out the good things that we're doing while failing to point out the bad things that are gripping and killing our lives. Because we want to give everybody a good portrayal of our life. But you don't recognize and see that that good portrayal and that mask that we put in front of us, it only blocks God from resurrecting your life on the inside. And we're going to know, we're going to learn that today. And so God is allowing this situation to happen, even though it broke Martha's heart. When she heard that Jesus was around, she ran to Jesus. She left everybody behind, her sister. She ran to Jesus. And the first thing she said, do you know how heartbroken you got to be to blame God for some stuff? Do you understand what it takes to do that? You got to be so broken. You got to feel so lonely, so isolated. I mean, the situation's got to be so grave that you actually look at God and say, God, if only you were here. If only you were here, God, this would never be happening. I would never be going through this if only you came through. You know how hurt you got to be to tell God that? That's got to be some pain. Well, we may sit back and look at Martha and be like, you little blasphemer. You little sinner. We have to look at the heart that she came with. She was broken. But she, she needed to be broken so that she could recognize that even she needed the resurrection for her own self. And God asked her, do you believe? Do you believe, Martha? But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. This is Martha talking to Jesus after she blamed him for some stuff. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. This resurrection, or in the Greek, the explanation of your brother will rise again is an explanation of talking about a transformed life, a new life, right? And so Martha answers Jesus in return, claiming that she knows Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection last day. She points all the way to the resurrection. That's the judgment they way back when, but fails to see the right now resurrection that Jesus Christ is trying to do. And then Jesus responds with one of the most powerful I am statements, and he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Notice that there's two kind of beliefs right there. There's a belief in him, right, with our words, but then there's a belief in him with our lives. Look at what he says one more time, right? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Look at verse 26. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You see that living, the only way to live unto Jesus by our belief is a living that has experienced the resurrection power of God on the spiritual side so that they can live for Jesus for the rest of their lives and that when they physically die, God raises them up from the dead and gives them a glorified body. See, we love only the first part. If I believe, I'm going to be okay in the last day. But we fail to read the rest of this stuff, and it says, when you live, live, those who live because of belief in me. A lot of us only have this arbitrary, this surface belief, because we never experience the resurrection power on the inside through belief that causes God to resurrect inside of us so that we can live for Jesus. I believe it's for that reason many of us are stuck in addictions. We're stuck in all type of things that are contrary to a life lived for God because we have failed to allow God to resurrect inside of us while we still confess with our mouths, but I believe, but I believe. And the question I have, do you believe? Do you really, really believe? Martha responds to Jesus' question, declaring, yes, Lord. She continues in her profession of faith and declares, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. These are words. This is the confession of her faith. She's with her words, right? I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. We're going to have a chance in the end of the service to confess this. But if this confession never touches your heart, that leads to a change and resurrection power of changing your life, you will leave out of these doors the very same way you came in, with a life that is contrary 
to living for Jesus. And so she said, I believe in this. And Jesus gave a twofold meaning to his declaration to being the resurrection of life, then poses the question, do you believe? The twofold meaning is one of spiritual death and physical death that both results in life that Jesus gives now in one spiritual resurrection as proved through Lazarus' pending resurrection and later in one's physical death through Jesus' resurrection resulting in everlasting life and proved through Jesus' resurrection in which he never tastes death again. Martha believed in the, in the latter resurrection while not uh, truly understanding in the present resurrection that Jesus was about to perform. Both must be believed and where lies the problem for Martha and the problem for many of us today where we accept the latter resurrection without realizing the former resurrection through faith, which must come first in order for us to experience the latter to be had, the spiritual coming before the physical. Jesus declares this, right? Some of y'all looking like, man, I don't know what you're saying, Pastor. Let me break it down with a verse. John 3, 3, the Amplified Bible, Jesus answers uh, a religious man, and he says this, I assure you, most solemnly I say to you, unless a person is what? Born again. What is being born again? Look at what he says. Reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, meaning set apart to God. He cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. You guys see that? He's talking about the first resurrection, which is a spiritual one that must happen in every believer's life. You must be born again. You must be spiritually transformed. You must be born from above. You must be renewed and set apart. If we are not first resurrected spiritually, we will never experience the kingdom of God. What does that mean? You will never make it to heaven. Heaven is not your destiny. And so we must believe and experience that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and he is the life. Amen? And so, unless we are born again, we will never experience that. We cannot have one without the other, my friend. We cannot pick and choose what side we want of Jesus' blueprint for salvation. We must either accept it all or deny all of it. But he would never have one to do half of it. Amen? And so Jesus asked, he asked Mary, do you believe? This leads us to our third conversation that Jesus had with Mary and the people I call, if you believe, if you believe. You see that word if? The if is a possibility. The if is like, uh, may, may not, right? But if you believe, if you actually take the actions to believe, to truly put your faith in Jesus Christ and all that he has said and all that he has done, that it changes and transforms your life and makes you born again. If you believe. Mary goes back to inform Mary in this, in this whole situation that Jesus is asking for. Mind you, Mary stood home. She didn't follow Mary, uh, Martha. She stood home, maybe she, because she was so broken, probably more broken than Mary, her, uh, Martha herself that she stays home weeping with everybody else, right? There was Jews with her. And so she stays home. Martha goes back, and she tells Mary, Mary, Jesus is asking. He's asking for you, right? She says, Mary reaches Jesus. She fell at his feet and said, Lord, look at what she says, very similar to Martha. Lord, if only you were here, my brother would not have died. If only you were here. If only, God. And some of us are asking that same question, if only, God, if only, God, just a few more moments, God, if you were just here, God, I waited for you all night, God, if only you had came through, God, if only. And yet Jesus allows her to express her heart. He allows her to express her emotions. He didn't hold it back. He didn't tell her, be silent, woman, you're ignorant. N none of that. He let her express herself. And he not only let her express herself, but he took on her pain. And he took on her agony. Jesus sees and feels these things. He feels her pain and weeping that deeply moves his spirit, and it troubles him, the Bible says. Trying to hold back tears, he asks, where did they lay Jesus, or Lazarus? The Bible says, 
So they go and they show him. And then the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. It says, Jesus then weeps through his love for them. And Lazarus, which is said of the Jews who were present, But Jesus never says why he wept. In verse 38, it says that Jesus was deeply moved. And again, again, as he came to the tomb, he stood before that cave where Lazarus was behind. And there was a stone that was in front of the the cave entrance so that nobody can go in and no one can come out. And it says he was moved again, hurt by these things, trying to hold back tears. He begins to weep in sorrow and agony. That the Jews that were there said, man, look at how much he loved them. Look at this. But couldn't any, they mock him at the same time, say, but couldn't he who bought uh, sight to the blind bring back the dead and and spare him and, and keep him alive if he was only here? And in verse 38, he was moved again. It was a cave with a stone that laid across the entrance. And this is what I believe. I believe Jesus wept. And was deeply moved because he knew and was well aware of what sin that brings forth death brings upon his creation who was created in his image and likeness that brought deep love for his mankind. You see, John 3.16, many of us know this verse. Some of y'all got it tattooed somewhere on your body. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he, that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior should not perish but have eternal life. Listen to this. I believe Jesus felt his deep love while in heaven as he looked down to earth and saw his created people who were created in his image and likeness spiritually dead and separated from their God, resulting in death, that he came down to take their place on Good Friday to die for them and three days later resurrect for them and resurrect from the grave to give us all a new spiritual life to the forgiveness of sin and promised eternal life after physical death to be with him forever. You see, I don't think that was the first time Jesus wept. I think when he looked down and he seen mankind along with his Father and the Holy Spirit. And he recognized the separation between them and him, or them for that matter, right, a triune God. And he looked down and he recognized there's nothing that they can do for themselves. They're separated. They're spiritually dead. And only one can get them back in alignment and and in union with God. And God the Son said, Father, send me. Prepare a body for me. Send me. And I will go die in their place. I will take their place, God, to bring that union back so that we can have a relationship with them and they can have a relationship with us. We will resurrect them. And their spiritual death will become spiritual life, transformed and renewed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he does just that, and he sends his son Jesus, and he dies a brutal death on the cross, and three days later he resurrects. And so in this, God is showing us his emotion on earth through his human body that he cares for us. And while we think he is not present and he didn't show up, he reminds us that on the cross, that was me showing up for eternity, a past, present, and future, all lining up with the cross itself. That every time we think that God was not there and that God is not there, that we're able to go back to the resurrection, back to the cross, and recognize my God cares enough to come down himself and go on a cross and let us kill him and shed his blood, bury him, and he rise on the third day to say, God, forgive them, for they not knew what they do. But if they believe in me, I will give them everlasting life and I would resurrect them and give them spiritual life. When we doubt that God's with us, it is the resurrection that we must go back and look at, that it was because of us that he even came to die. It was because of us that he resurrected on the third day. And here it is, Jesus standing in front of the cave in the burial place of Lazarus, and a big stone was in the entrance of it. And he tells them, remove this stone. You know, Martha, she comes back in the scene. God, you won't do that. It must stink by now. The smell is probably unbearable. He's been in there three days. They say after two days without any kind of embalming, 
the body starts to smell so bad. This man is not only dead, but he's dead dead. And he's dead four days already. And not only just like in an open, you know, field where just the smell can go and kind of go everywhere, it's now closed in, in a cave, right, with a big old stone that's in front of it keeping every smell and every dead thing inside of it. Amen? And God gives that command, remove this thing. And so before that, listen, Jesus responds and says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Right? It is one thing to claim belief in God with words. It is another thing to claim God with actions in one's life in obedience to God's commandments. God knew the stone needed to be removed that he may show the glory of God. Just like in the death of Jesus, a stone had been rolled in front of him in his cave in which he removed himself. And you go back and you read the story of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. There was a stone there. But see, it was Jesus who moved that stone. And it wasn't just moved. When you go deeper into that, that story in history, that stone was not just moved away. It was like Jesus, Jackie Chan, that stone, and kicked that thing right out the way that it flew somewhere else, and then he sat on top of it. Why? Why would he do something like that? For humor? I don't think so. Jesus, he was funny. He probably was the funniest person on the face of this planet, right? But he did everything with precision, plan, purpose. Everything he showed was by example. And when he sat on this thing, and he kicked this rock, this stone, across from his grave, it was the equivalent of kicking sin and defeating it once and for all. The sin that held us captive to our spiritual death. And see, some of us, even right now, we're inside this grave. And we put a stone in front of us, the stone of sin. And see, nobody can come in and nobody can go out. And yet Jesus is standing in front of our, our grave site. And there's a stone in front of it. And just like he said in Revelation, right, I stand at the door. And I knock. I stand at the door and I knock. You see, Jesus could Jackie Chan, your, your, your door, in no time. Just kick it in like the SWAT team and come in with guns blazing and tell you, you're going to serve me because I'm God and you're not. I died for you. I purchased you with my blood. That's it. Your party's over. Start flipping over tables. Start removing people from your life. Don't matter if you care about it or not, if you allow it to or not. You know, he can do that because he's God. But he refuses to do that. Instead, he knocks. And he asked, can you remove this stone? Can you get these things out the way so I can come in? Can you open up this door? And see, for many of us, we'll crack it. Right? We'll crack it, and then we'll look from the corner. Jesus, like, hey, Jesus, can you let me in? I, my house is dirty right now, Lord. Yeah, you, you want to come back at 12? Okay, come back at 12. And Like weird stuff, right? Like just a little bit. God, I can't let you in, God, because, God, I, I've been smoking weed. I'm still dealing with that stuff. God, I know, God, I know. I know, God, I, I got to fix my life up first, God, and then I'm going to let you in the cave, okay? I'm going to let you in. You can do whatever you want. Just gotta, I got I to clean my life up first, right? I got to do some things first, God. I got some skeletons in this cave, God. You want to... You want to smell this, that smells, that stuff smells bad. See, because our sin is a bad aroma to the nostrils of God. He can't even be around it. So we needed the blood of Jesus to cover our sins and to remove that so he can come into a cave and dwell with us and remove everything that's not of him out of that cave. See, but we have a habit of trying to claim some good things, thinking we're righteous. And we say, well, I don't want to give my life to God right now because I'm still dealing with stuff and I'm living with somebody in my house that's not my spouse. And so I can't give my life fully to God yet, right? I'm still dealing with drugs and alcoholism. I'm still dealing with all these other things. So, God, I'll crack it open for you, and I'll see you from the outside. But you can't come in right now, God. I'm not ready for that, God. I'm not ready for that. And see, Jesus is not going to kick the door down. What he is going to say is, I am the resurrection and I'm the life, right? Do you believe that? Because if you do, then I ain't scared of what you got in this cave. I'm telling you, open up the door. I come in. And I'm going to dine with you. I don't care what kind of socks you got on the floor. I don't care what you got hiding inside this closet right now. I don't care about none of these things. But if you but let me in, I will show you resurrection power and the life in which I can give you. And so he stands before this cave, and they're like, no, God, don't come in. And finally, Martha, who confessed faith with her mouth, with words, now it was time to put action, and she hesitated. God, but no, there's, there's smelling in there. And see, right now, God is tugging on your heart to give you resurrection power and save your life. 
And we're telling God, no, no, God, wait. It smells in here, God. It smells like Afghan weed. It smells like some other stuff over here, God. I got plants growing in the other room, God. I got cursing in this room right here. You definitely want to go in that room, God. I use bad language in that room. That's the kitchen when I'm trying to cook and my husband's messing with me and whatever it is, right? Like, God, don't go in that room. God, no, God, he can't, can't go, definitely can't go in my bedroom, God. I got DVDs in there, God. I got a computer. got so much garbage on there, God. You know everything that's going on, God. Don't mess with my bedroom, God. I can't do it. And we hesitate thinking that there is going to come a time where we're going to clean up our lives. I come to tell you that time would never, ever, ever come. Because the Bible says today is the day for salvation. Today is resurrection power. It's not just a day we celebrate, but every day God gives us an opportunity to live in this, in this life here. It's an opportunity to say, God, just come on in, God. I'm done. That's it. I'm done. I submit, God. Remove the stone. God, come in. Come in, God. Come in. And so this leads us to the final conversation. It's the conversation with the deceased. The conversation with dead people. See, we may see only Lazarus is dead. But I want to tell you right now, there's a lot of dead people in this room. There's a lot of deceased people right now that Jesus Christ is trying to talk to today. Just like he talked to Lazarus 2,000 plus years ago. They took the stone away and Jesus looks up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. The question is, do we believe? He did all of this so that we can believe. And he prays to the Father. And after Jesus prays, he shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And look at what the word says. The dead man came out. Why not say Lazarus comes out? Why say the dead man came out? Why not call the name? They all know it's Lazarus. They all know who he's calling. He said it. Lazarus, come out. But then the description of the white witnesses says the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Uh, face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. That was verse 44. What would they say to dead man? Because I believe there was other dead people inside that grave. And I believe that Jesus Christ had to use the word Lazarus because if he would have said, come out, all type of dead people would have came out of that cave. Everybody named Mama that was dead and buried in that cave would have came out mummified, talking about, hey, what's going on? What's happening? But he calls out to Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. And they say the dead man came out. So we have to understand, listen, I believe they said the dead man came out because it made it universal. That there's other dead people that if God would just call their name and they would reply and answer, that they can come out of their cave as well and receive resurrection power today. And even today, God is calling your name out. And he's saying, Brian, come out. Pachecos, come out. Mercados, come out. Ramoses, come out. Right? Whatever your name is today, come out. But see, he waited there. It took Lazarus to come out, mummified, wrapped up in grave clothes with a cloth over his face, just kind of hopping away outside the entrance of the cave, and he came out. Today, God is calling your name. Come out. Come out. Don't hesitate. Don't stay in there. Don't look at your grave clothes. Don't look at man, but I'm still wrapped up in sin. Man, I'm still wrapped up with death. God said, come out, and he came out with grave clothes. And then he says some powerful stuff in the end. He said, take off those grave clothes and let him go. You see, my Lord doesn't just resurrect us with power. He gives us life after that. And he's able to tell us, take off those clothes. God, but these clothes, God, they're going to shame me. God, I've been used to these clothes. This is what they called me all my life. And God is saying, take off those clothes and come out. And then he says, let him go. Who was holding him? There weren't no people there. Everybody was scared to grab. I would have been scared to grab. You imagine, you imagine Lamon coming out the grave, wrapped up. I ain't touching this man. I'm like, do you on your own from here? I don't even know what's going on anymore. This is beyond my brain. 
I don't even know how to handle you, bro. Then you're about six something. I'm, I'm running. I'm taking off. If you can make it here next Sunday, bro, I'll touch you. But you got some things to work out. And you got some changing to do. And you probably need some Irish spring. And, but see, God wasn't afraid. You see, he wasn't afraid to deal with Lazarus. He says, take off them grave clothes, number one. And number two, let him go. What was on him? You say, death. I think what was even more on him was sin. And he says, sin, let him go. Addiction, let him go. Pornography, let him go. Adultery, let him go. Alcoholism, let him go. Addiction to weed, whatever, let him go. Let him go. He is free. He is resurrected, and I've given him life, and it's new life, right? And some of us, well, how do you know, Pastor? You go, you stretching this thing. When you go home, you read the next chapter of John, and you see that they didn't just come to see Jesus. They came to see Lazarus. Why? Because Lazarus, after he took off his grave clothes and he, those things let him go, Lazarus became a living witness who was alive now in a testimony to the God who is the ultimate resurrection and the life. So when they seen Lazarus, they said, God has to be real because I see one of his soldiers that were born again and now living for him. I have a reason to believe. Here's another one. There's another one. There's one over there. There's one over there. There's one here. There's one there. And God is saying, listen, I can resurrect you and I can give you a new life so that when other people come see you, you can point them to them and say, I am who I am because of the great I am of the resurrection and the life. And so I challenge you today, my friend, would you come out? Would you come out and hear the words of God say, let them go. Stop allowing sin to keep you in that cave. Stop allowing the stone of sin to block your way of getting to Jesus. Grave clothes and addictions. Today is resurrection power day. And God wants to resurrect your life. He wants to resurrect you. And so stop resisting. Stop giving excuses. I'm not jumping all the way in. There is a time where it will be too late. You see, Lazarus died again. He didn't stay alive. He died again. His life that he lived before he died again, he lived unto the Lord. You see, when God saves our lives, he saves us, gives us resurrection power, transforms us so that we can live for him until we see him face to face again. You see, and I know God has been talking to somebody in it the whole time. And I want to challenge you today. Would you come out of your grave and let Jesus and his resurrection power and life fill you up today? If I can get the worship team to come up here. I'm going to challenge you today. I'm going to challenge you in the ways of the Lord to come out and let God have his way in your life. Galatians says this in 326. Galatians, Amplified Version. For you, anybody you in here, any yous in here, anybody alive right now breathing, says who are born again have been reborn from above spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are children of God, set apart for his purpose with full rights and privileges through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were once baptized or were baptized into Christ into a spiritual union with Christ, the anointed have clothed yourselves with Christ. That is, you have taken on his characteristics and his value. You may have grave clothes on today, but God is saying, take off those clothes and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on his character, put on his values, and let God move in your life today. Amen? Can we all stand right now and give God glory?